Have we got you, Jim? More tempted to uh, wish that Murray kept on speaking. But there it is. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. We've got you now, yeah. Oh, you can. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. The book of Acts 19. Paul has come into Ephesus. One of the leading cities in the Greco-Roman world. The center of the worship of Diana. That's what the Romans called her. Artemis. Um, the Greeks, yeah? But the center of all of that worship. Hmm. Paul later, when he's talking about it, said, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Whatever happened there, he's not talking about literal animals, but whatever happened there, the nearest thing he got to describing it was a wrestle, as people would have done in the amphitheater when sent. Uh, as a preamble to the gladiators and the animals would come at them. So what happens there? He begins an assembly there. If, if <clears throat> you, you are going to profit from my babbling way of going to buy things, you would need to read Acts 19 for yourself, yes? Uh, when, when, when we're all done here, at a time that suits you. Hmm. He begins an assembly of God's people there. He begins then to work the works of God in teaching, preaching, and working remarkable miracles, the text tells us. Hmm. But you know, in the earlier days, it, the enemies of the Lord wasn't so much worried about miracles. Yeah, well, they could, couldn't do anything about it, of course. But they weren't worried about the miracles. If you read Acts chapters 3 and 4, you know it really worried them. Apostolic preaching, talking, teaching. They said, shut up, or we'll put you in prison. And the fellow said, we're not doing it. So they ended up in prison. Anyway, they got out of prison, as you know. And the first thing they did, they went to the corners and they started speaking again. And they got them back in and they beat them up again and said, stop talking. This is all in the text, three and four yeah, in Acts, and you'll read it for yourself, won't you? After they beat him up again, the apostolic oh, pair, uh, apostolic more than that, but the apostolic pair head back to their own, said the text. And when they got back with their own group, they prayed. And what did they pray for? Armor. So, you know, something I got, muscle. No, nothing like that. They prayed, give us boldness to speak. You know what? You know, there's volcanoes. There are earthquakes, there are tornadoes, and hurricanes, tsunamis. And then there are words. 
then there are words. There is such power in speech, even lies. Hmm. But the power of speaking truth is way stronger than lies because lies, no lie, lasts forever. But truth does. And I've been thinking uh, recently, well, on and off for a good while, but recently I've been thinking about home, being back where you, where you are and I. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I know this, that I've been more aware. I've been very much aware, but even now more aware of what we owe to all the men and women over the years in the British Isles, in Wales, in Scotland, in England, in Northern Ireland, and so just the whole, the whole group. And then I listened to Tony Coffey uh, last time out when he worked with Colossians. I've always respected and liked uh, the coffees, of course. But there's something that that brings it rightly home when you hear someone talk about Colossians and make Jesus the center. As we heard there just a few moments ago when we were additionally framing our minds to suffer with the living Christ and the kingdom. Yeah. Speech, gospeling, making him the center. Hmm. Who is this that we're talking about when we hear someone say he gives us peace? Who is it? Peace? I've got peace. We've got peace. Are we serious or what? Yeah, we are, we're serious. <laughs> what's, the, what's all this peace business? Why are we all worried and on and on and on, don't you see? Well, the peace he gives is not our peace. It's God's peace. He panics about nothing. He doesn't panic at all, not about anything. And so he says to you and me, this is too sounding too glib. He says to you and me, you start panicking. When I start panicking, and that's never going to happen. Yeah, but still, I, I, I feel the stress. And that's true. That's true. Did he, is he surprised at that? Is he angry at us? Did he promise one thing that he's not fulfilling? No. <laughs> uh, you know the reason we're in this world? Because he wants us in this world. John 17, 14 to 19. You read this at your leisure. He says to the Father, you give me the word, I gave it to them. They received it and the world hates them. It doesn't mean every man, woman, boy, and girl hates Christians. He means there's a world structured that's demonically and satanically hovering over everyone. It's a world that we at the beginning and our father and mother, we reconfigured the whole world of God. We invite it in evil power. And we live in that world. We're born into it. Yeah. 
we were born all innocent little babies. What happened? Somewhere along the line, you know, maybe um, we've been taken care of or not been taken care of. Maybe we have been the wrong kinds of friends. Maybe we were hurt and we learn how bitterness is. We learn about warfare and all those things. And we then protect ourselves in all the way that others people want to hurt us by. And so we feed one another with what doesn't work for starters and what is unlike Christ ultimately. Huh. He's in Ephesus. He's working all the miracles. And what? He says that you've got to read, uh, I said 18, I mean 19 if I said 18. You have to read it. He said there isn't any God but God. That's all there is a Python. Jesus learned that himself. He learned that from Moses as a little growing boy when his mother would have taught him and sang the songs. By and by as he grows in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, from a little baby up to the young man, he becomes the preacher. But by the age of 12, he knows the story. But until then, he's learning it. And he's learning it from the prophets. And he got his truth where you got yours. God gave to him the truth as he has given it to you. And then, of course, by and by, knowing himself who he was, then his relationship with God deepened in a way that yours and mine can not. For he never feared anything. No text, no text in scripture says that Jesus was afraid. Was he a real human? Yeah, he was, he was. Well, why wasn't he afraid then? <laughs> because he had come to trust God. Mm. And God said to him what he says to you and me, don't panic until I panic. And I'll never do that. And Jesus Christ himself, this human, he experienced the peace of God. He looked at his father, knew who his father was, all of that. He knew, but he did more than know it. He felt it. His relationship with his father as he grew from boyhood and all of that deepened, became purer. All that, more assured that he heard, though. Oh, all the time. All the time he heard. That's not fear. That's not panic. That's being. A human. And Romans 8, verse 3 says that he, Jesus, was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. He lived in a world with sinners. He himself, no sinner, but he lived in a world that sinners dominated. The powerful ones did what they did. But his pain was like yours. Most of the hurt, this is my guess anyway, the most of the hurt that many of us experience is not physical, though we suffer physical pain quite a bit. But you know the worst pain? Well, this is my opinion anyway. It's unrequited love. It's watching the hurt of people that we love more than we love ourselves. The bulk 
of our sorrow, the bulk of our hurt is not about ourselves. It's about people we would gladly die for. And currently, to the degree that God enables us, we live for them. Yeah. So he's in Ephesus. He's doing what he's doing. He's working the miracles and all of that. And then he's speaking and saying, there's only one God and it's not her. Diana, the big statue and the shrines and the temples and not her. God alone is God and he's the God and father of Jesus Christ and good grief. Bertie mentioned what is a serious concern of humans, loss of job that leads to loss of home, that leads to loss of, here we go. While he's in Ephesus in 19, he's saying there's only one God and it's not her. And in that city, you read this in Acts 19, in that city, Alexander, the, um, the coppersmith, a guy who headed up the industry, they made shrines of Diana, how they made a living. You know, they had a riot for two solid hours yelling. Great is Diana of the Ephesians, the town clerk. The only way he could get that rioting, crying out stop, he said, everybody in the world knows that she is the chief goddess and god of the world. Mm -hmm. But all the while he spoke, they're rioting and, and threatening. And, and finally, of course, in other uh, situations, they beat up and they killed and they did this, that, and the other. Huh. Paul later writes, oh, and, and many became believers. And they sold all their magic books. This is Max 19. I, I, I hate to keep saying it's Max 19, but I, I would like you to read it for yourself since I'm not reading the text, which is a problem with me. I read it when I'm on my own. But when I start to talk, I, I don't want to take my eyes off you or, or whatever. So I, I'm sorry about that. But read it, read Acts 19. And I've forgotten what I was saying because I had that little deal there. That's, that's me. But you already knew that, didn't you? So here he is in Acts 19. One God, only one God. He's ruining an industry for pity's sake. So they're all mad at him. And they treat the brothers and the sisters who come up and become believers. And the brothers and the sisters sell their magic books and their little shrines and have nothing more to do. This is in the middle. This is in sort of in the middle of Russia when you're proclaiming Russia is a loser or in the middle of um, um, the Ukraine. Standing up and saying, Ukrainians are losers. In the middle of Ephesus, he said, Diana's a loser. I'm not saying he was angry or sounding like the way I am, but maybe he wasn't. But he did say this. She doesn't exist. She's an imagination. She's a big shrine up there. And so he's threatening their livelihood. And what is happening today is precisely the same thing. Well, well, we don't worship gods today. Oh, don't we? Don't we? Anything, any source, any power, the people 
obtained as a substitute for going to God yeah. to supply anything that we choose as a substitute for the creator and the Lord God who loves us is a God. Yeah. And as long as we depend on war to supply what we really need, we're worshiping the Roman god Mars, or call it Greek, Ares. As long as we trust war, as long as we booze around and carouse around and all of that, Dionysus is very much a line. As long as we trust as a substitute the medical world, Asclepius, the god of healing, is very much alive. Should we not get the benefits of the, well, of course, these are gifts of God, but they're not substitutes. And to depend on them for peace, to depend on them for hope, to demand, depend on them for freedom, to depend on them for life beyond this life. They're going to make us into robots now, if you want. That's not a joke. The leading industry now, besides the industry of knowledge, is technology, not medicine, but technology. And Ben Quirtzell, who is the leading scientist and the CEO and one of the big uh, robotics uh, industries, says the day's going to come and not before long. When if people want to be turned into machines, we're going to have to give them the right to do that. And they're working on it. Yeah. If you don't want him, if you do not want God, well, you, you don't get him and you get the result of that. But anything that we put in, I don't care, Christian or non Christian. Anything that we set up as a substitute for our ultimate needs. These are gods. As long as we worship physical beauty, as long as we are excessively engaged in sexual pursuit and all of that, Aphrodite is very much aligned. Call her what you want. As long as we seek freedom at the cost of rejecting God, we are worshiping Thoth and other gods of freedom, the gods of power. We don't bind down to them. We worship them when we make them a substitute for God. And look at you. You know who you are? Your group of Frodo's. You know who Frodo is? Frodo was the wing, the, the ring carrier in the fellowship of the rings. The ring of evil has to be carried and dropped into its utter destruction. And all the way through Tolkien's work that then was dramatized. Yeah. 
he carries the ring to its destruction. He's limited. He, he's, he's hurt and all the rest of it. He's like you. He's like you. We are the people with all of our limits, but who Christ will not let go alone and keeps calling on us, saying things like, I chose you. Eh? I chose you. And there will be those. And I'm looking at the list of uh, the people you're praying for, the sickness. It's all over the place. Yeah. Your friends and mine. We're selfish, but we're not so selfish that we can't look around and see even strangers. Awfully troubled. And we feel saddened by it. Yeah. Yeah. But when people sneer, and there are those who sneer and jeer, like that foul-mouthed Richard Dawkins, the atheist, a brilliant, highly credentialed molecular uh, biologist using the gutter speech against all that you and I stand for. When people like that, and then I can multiply names, but never, never mind, you know what I'm talking about. When they jeer and say, how can you people, how can you continue to hope? Look at you, pathetic little people getting feeble as you get older and, and all of that, not knowing where to go, confused and everything else. You're a bunch of losers like Celsa said back in the second century. Washer women, slaves, servants of all kinds. That's the only kind of people that Christianity calls to itself. Yeah, and then Tertullian said in response to what he said, yeah, and these are the washerwomen who were torn apart, raped, plundered, who were burned, who were lynched because they wouldn't stop believing. But do you know, now I'm saying Tertullian said all that. It's brilliant uh, stuff. I have a very tough fellow Tertullian. I wouldn't want to be a non-Christian to meet him in the dark. I think he would have, you know, it is an injury. But Peter will say, Peter will say in First Peter chapter 3, to you, to me, to us, us together, for we don't exist as Christians independently. We only exist as Christians because we're in Christ. And whoever is in Christ, we're one body. We don't exist. You're not a Christian without me. I'm not a Christian without you. We are distinguishable one from another. But as Christians, we're not separable one from another because we're only Christians, because we're all together in Christ. Peter then in 1 Peter 3 says, sanctify the Lord to yourself. You know, get him in there and all of that. And he said, he said this, and this is the phrasing I'm interested in, 1 Peter 3, 15. He says, have an answer, ready, have an answer to everyone that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. 
Now don't swagger about it, he said, but do it, have an answer. And I listen to, I do, I do, I listen to quite a few in the academy, religious, academic fellows. And all I hear, well, not all I hear, almost all I hear, well, we don't have an answer for human suffering and all of that. Oh, yeah? Oh? And Peter said, be ready to have an answer. And we're saying, <laughs> we don't have an answer. But you know how he opened this book, First Peter? Read First Peter when you get this chance, will you? Peter speaks. He's an apostle, of course, but he speaks to those who are, here's what he calls you, you, me, us, them, those who are in Christ. Here's what he said. I'm writing to those who are the chosen. That's who you are, Frodo. That's who you are. You are chosen. You are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, not yesterday. It wasn't a fly by night arrangement. It wasn't an off the cuff anything. I'm writing to those that are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Yeah. And then he lists the places where they're. A living. He said, who are sanctified, made different by the Spirit of God, and who have been sprinkled with the blood, the covenant blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when they sprinkled the blood on the posts and all of that, God came and it was a Passover and he took them home. All of these things are descriptions of the people he's writing to. And why is he telling them all that? He wants them to know who they are. And then he said, these are the ones who you are sprinkled with the blood of Christ on the obedience. Who, who are, have been born again. Listen to this. Here's the answer, he said. Yeah, I'm going to give you an answer, he said, and I'll be ready. And the answer is all that we said up to there. And then he says, you've been born again. Born again. By, not a nice story, not a piece of, of literature like Tolkien and Frodo and the like that, that illustrate something fundamentally, historically true. You've been born again unto a living, throbbing hope by a story. Well, yeah, but not really. More than the gospel. The gospel is telling the story about actual occurrences mm -hmm. you've been born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead well i'm happy for christ and so are you if anybody should have earned the right to be resurrected Jesus earned it. Well, I'm happy for him, but uh, what does that mean to you and me? What does that mean to my Ethel? My Jim and Linda and George. What does it mean to others of my circle who mean everything to me and you and yours what does it mean to them what does it mean to us that christ rose in the dead and christ whispers to you 
I did it for you. I did it for you. In the world, 1633 of John, in the world, you will have tribulation, but in me, peace, cheer up, for I have overcome the world. That's the one that was raised. And he's telling you and me, I'm resurrected. Look at me. I'm immortal. I'm incorruptible. I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. And we say, we're happy for you. He says, you should be. For it's for you. I did this for you. Nobody. John 10, 18. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down of myself. I lay it down, not because I think life is terrible. No. I lay it down that I might take it again. Better than it ever was. More glorious than it ever was when I was in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 7 speaks about Christ in the days of his flesh when he cried sore and asked for help from his father and got it in some Yeah. He said, I did all of this for you. Not just for you. For everybody. I want them to want it, but if they don't want it, if they look at me, and don't know that in me is life. And oh, the wisdom and knowledge, if they don't see that, it's because 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. You see all of the people in the world who will not have him and that substitute for him all these helpers. What they say when they do this, rejecting him and going for support for everything they need to others, they're saying what Israel did in the wilderness. These are your gods. The word Elohim is plural as well as singular. So however you render it, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. Or these represent your gods that brought you out of Egypt. They did the same thing in the wilderness that we do today. These powers, these are the gods that bring us out of all of our trouble. But this Moses, they said, we don't know where he is. And those who are the enemies of you know who, they say, this Jesus, we don't know where he is. But he said, what has he done for you? He's king of kings and lord of lords. And that's what Paul told the Ephesians. In chapter one of Ephesians, he said, I pray for you all the time. And what did he pray for? Muscle. No, you know, he didn't pray that God would give them muscle. He prays, this is what he says, he says it repeatedly in Ephesians. I want God to open your eyes so that you will know who you are in and with and for him. I want you to know. Why didn't he, uh, in the middle of a city of rioters, in the middle of a city that did kill Christians and would kill Christians and do it to this day in other parts of the world. In the middle of a city like that, he prays for them, not Mosul. I want you to know who you are. Hmm. And then he says, I want you to know the 
power of God that works in you. This is one seventeen and following in Ephesians. Read it when you get the chance, all right? He said, I want you to know who you are, and I want you to know the power that is at work in you according to the power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and that dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Ah, that's who he is. And Paul said, you know what I'm praying for you? I'm praying for you, power, not muscle, redeeming power, the power to break. Well, what's he doing right now? Well, I'll tell you what he's done. This Christ who's got all this power, I'll tell you one thing he has done. He's made a believer out of me. Made a believer out of you. Multiply you and me with millions. Multiplied millions. Never once forcing anyone to follow him. Is he a king? Absolutely. But he said, my kingdom is not the kind of kingdoms of the world. It's not like that. If my kingdom were like that, my servants would carry bazookas, AK-47. They'd come in in tanks and they'd have smart bombs and all the rest of it. That's not my kingdom. But power? Made a believer out of my asshole. Linda, George, and Jim. And that matters to me. And you, you think of the people who are beloved to you and close in and all the rest of it. He made a believer out of them. And the consequences of that? Peter, you've been gotten again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Unto, unto an inheritance. First Peter 1, 5 and following. Unto an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fadeless, reserved for you. So when the guy comes up to a Christian and says, Christian who's having serious trouble and still believing, refusing to leave, Still staying. Yeah, well, what have you got for pity's sake? How can you keep on hoping in these set of circumstances? And the Christian will say, <laughs> The Christian will say, Have you any idea who you're talking to? Not swaggering. No. Do you have any idea who you're talking to? Look at me, the Christian will say. I am one of the chosen of God, one that God had in mind before the world was made. Yeah, that's who I am. You know where I'm going? I am going to a new mode of being. Where you see all this illness, you see all this backache, you see all this cancer, you see all of this, that, and the other that I'm not making light of right now, but you see all of that. One day I'll wave goodbye to all of that. Different world. And you're asking me, how can you hope 
in the middle of all of that. We could very well say, oh, how can you hope in this world or out of it? Hmm? Yeah, but well, see, it's all the great stories, all these great movies that move you and all the rest of it. I don't mind being moved. I don't mind being weepy when something tender and all that is shown. It's okay by me. But our faith, your faith, the faith of all the millions down the years are not built on that. They're built on him. And he's a lying. He's a lying. And because he is alive, the life that you now live, you live by faith in him. As Paul said in Galatians 2.19, I through the law died to the law that I might live under God. And the life that I now live, I live in Christ. He said, but it's not me that's living, it's Christ that's living in me. And he says, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not only rose for me, died for me in the first place, he believes in the cosmic story. He believes in the multiplied millions, but he makes it clear in a passage like that. It's not just the millions, though thank God it is the multiplied millions. It's not just the multiplied millions. It's you. It's you. It's you, whatever your name is. Maybe there's somebody, I don't know if people watch this right sign. But the, the, the people who are hosting this thing uh, to get it out to you, they hurt like everybody else. For Jesus said in John 17, 14, and following them, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm nearly done, okay? I don't know how long I've been talking, but I'm nearly finished. So you're doing well, okay? He said, Father, you gave me the word, I gave it to them, and the world hates them for it. That is this, this throbbing, evil, satanic, devilish world that does things to people and to one another, rapes and plunders and all of that. That world, that world hates us. But he has put us into that world. And he says in 17, John, he said, I don't want them taken out of the world. I want you to keep them from the evil one. And as you have sent me into the world, even so send I them. That's who you are. You're the sent. You're the chosen. Well, what do you suppose to do then? What do you suppose to do? What, what does he want from you? What, what have you been doing? How long have you been married? You who are married. How have you responded that way? You who have children. How do you treat the children? You who work. What, uh, what do you do? How do, how do you do your job? Honest and, and all of that? You say thank you to people? Do you pray for people? Do you refuse some places? You refuse to go there? Because Christ wouldn't want you to go? You don't use some speech? Because he wouldn't want you to use it? You won't react in certain fashions and manners? Because you'd make him sad. That's who you are. And that's what you're doing. And that's what you're doing. Yeah, well, that's not. Well, that's what it feels like when you're watching the movies and you're seeing movie like 
saving Private Ryan, where gallantry is shown and fellows are throwing themselves down, giving their life up for somebody else. All of that. You see that and you think, I'm sitting here in a chair and, and everything is comfortable. At war? I'm not at war. Never argue. Never argue at what he says in scripture. If he says you're at war, you're at war. And so you are. And your steadfast refusal when you're weary physically, emotionally, socially, all of that, when you're weary and you will not leave. And when the old thing, oh, good grief, what's the point? When that comes, you dismiss that. And you never know what you've already done. You may. How would I know? But you may have already done specifically the thing that you were born to do. And out from your kindness, out from more than your kindness, but your faith in God. Out from your faith in God, you affect somebody and they become a believer. And then the ripples go out. Night, 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 and only a day ahead will the whole story be told about your life and how the war that you carry on. Trusting, 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 and end up like Jacob in the middle of a nowhere place that he later calls Bethel. God is here and I didn't know it. But you know it. God bless you. Thank you.